Hello everybody, I'm Nick and in this video I'm going to show you how you can get started with event sourcing in .NET using arguably the best library to do this in .NET and that is Martin. Now Martin is unique in its way of doing event sourcing because usually you'd use an event sourcing specific database like Event Store which I don't recommend at all. I've used it in production at scale and it's terrible at scaling. And other companies like myself in the past who has implemented event sourcing in a payment system would use something like DynamoDB or Cosmos DB because of the structureless nature of it, the partitioning that comes with it, as well as the ability to have transactions to build projections and also a stream which you can listen for those changes and do things with it. However, Martin decided to use an RDBMS for it. Postgres, which is an excellent uh, database, by the way, it's my recommended RDBMS as well. And it's using its features very, very smartly and very efficiently. Now, I've talked about event sourcing and the concept of event sourcing already. I'm going to put a link to that video over there in case you want to check that. However, here I'm going to show you how to implement the concept using Martin directly. I will explain what event sourcing is in principle. However, I will go straight into it, assuming you're going to use this library. So let me show you what I have here. I have this API, which doesn't really have an implementation yet. And all this API is representing is orders. I can create an order over here with this request. I can update the delivery address if I want. And the order ultimately uh, looks like this. So it has the create order request, delivery update request. Then we have a dispatch call where you just say that the order has been dispatched then you have the out for delivery and then you have the delivered. So these endpoints update the state of the order as the order goes through its stages in the same way it would if you order something from something like Amazon, for example. Now, normally what you'd have is you'd have an RDBMS or any other database and you just store the state. So you have an order object and then you just update fields on that object on that entry in the database. However, event sourcing is different. In event sourcing, everything that happens to something is an event. It is something that happened in a moment in time and it's true, meaning you never actually delete or update anything. You just create, you just append events in a sequence of flows. So you have the create order event, the update delivery address event, the order dispatched event, the order out for delivery and so on. And then you would aggregate those events to see the current state. This allows you to do a few things. You can actually see exactly what happened on a given object. So it gives you like a, this built in audit log of what happened, as well as the ability to time travel and see what the state is at a given moment in time. And ultimately, because storage is cheap, it's the compute that is expensive. I will also show you how you don't have to recompute everything as you go with Martin through projections. Again, excellent library, very feature rich, and it does way more than I will show you here. It has multi tenancy, it can do tons of things. I'm not sponsored by Martin in any way, but I just genuinely like the library. I don't like everything that JasperFX does, the company behind it. However, this is an excellent product and I do recommend it for everyone. So like I said, everything is represented as events. So I'm going to show you the events first. What I'm just going to do is create an events class. I'm not saying you should do this, but I'm just going to put all of my events in here so you can have a group of them in case you want to grab the code and play around with it. So here's an example of how the events would look. So we have this order created event where we have the ID that we give it an ID every time we create it. I'm using the new sort of create version seven GUIDs of .NET 9. Now we have the product name and the delivery address. This is overly simplified. This model would be way more feature rich actually. And you have a product ID here instead linking to a product. But for the purpose of the demo, I'm going to oversimplify it just so you don't have to look at 15 different things at the same time. So this represents an order being created. This is the order being updated. The ID still refers to that order ID. Uh, order dispatched, order out for delivery, and then order delivered. So you see that we have these dates, which, by the way, because the events have a date in themselves, you don't have to have explicitly a date here unless that date is coming from somewhere else and you have to provide it but I'm adding it just to show some state change. So now we have all of the events here that represent different stages on the life cycle of that order. However, because I do want to represent that order object and not just events, I need to basically aggregate into something, project into something. I'm going to also create an order class. Now, by default, my order class will just have this, the ID, product name, delivery address, and then the other times related to what happened to that order. And you can extrapolate things like, has it been dispatched yet? Well, if daytime is null, then it hasn't been dispatched. If out for delivery, then it's not out for delivery and so on. 
And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce Martin in all of this. So Martin is just a library. You go ahead and you search for Martin and you install it. And then we're going to go to program.cs and we're going to do a bit of wiring up. So what you need to say is just like any other library, you just say add Martin over here and you shouldn't just leave it like this. You need to configure it. So let's go ahead and go into options over here. The first thing you need to specify is the connection. I have a Postgres database here. I'm just going to run it in the background. So I have a database running completely clean. So if I go over here, that's the only database running. And then I'm going to go and just have the connection string. So this connects me to that database. Then I'm going to say explicitly that I want to use system.text.json for serialization because ultimately that data will be stored as JSON and Postgres has a specific JSON type for its fields. So it's very optimized to store JSON objects. And then I'm going to say that, yeah, if this is in development, please create all the schema in the database for me. So it will create all the tables and everything needed for Postgres's wiring up. If I go ahead and I refresh this, and actually, yeah, here we go. Then you see it's an empty database. It doesn't really have anything. So now with Martin in, how would I create the post where I create a new order? Well, first I would take that request and I would create an event out of it. So I'm taking the request and I'm mapping it into that order create event. Then what I need to do is inject the I document store, which is a Martin's type of way of dealing with data in that database because Martin can be used for event sourcing, but it can also be used if you just want to use it as a JSON sort of store via library. But ultimately, you should be using this for event sourcing. Then after that, you want to get a lightweight session. And with that session, you want to say session.events. And you can start a new stream of a specific type. I can say it's of type order. And you have a few overloads here. You can just pass the event. So I could just say, do this. I could also pass the ID of the order as well. So I can say, here's the order ID, and it's going to use that GUID as the order ID. And then I'm going to have the event. You should, by the way, in your events, have a GUID or string named ID. This is needed. Otherwise, you won't be able to just save anything. And then I'm going to say, just like EF Core, session dot save changes async and that's it and then in the end i'm going to say return results dot okay i'm not returning created because i don't want to have to pass down the get endpoint with the name and i'm just going to return the order on the way out so now this should implement me creating an order but how do you get an order out of it? Let's just implement the get order by async method. So because we're querying, I'm going to use the iQuery session interface over here, which allows us to query the store. And I'm going to say var order equals await session dot events dot aggregate stream async. And I'm going to give out the stream ID, which in this case is going to be the order ID. And I'm going to specify that what I'm getting back here is the order class. And then I'm going to say, if the order is not null, then return OK with the order. Otherwise, return not found. Very basic stuff. Now, ultimately, what aggregate stream async will do is it will on the fly use that ID to get the entire stream and then apply every event on that stream. But how will it do that? We never really defined any of that on the events or on the order. Well, you actually have to define that on the order. And the way you do it is you create a public void apply method. And what you apply is the event you want to apply. So in this case, created order, create order request. So we have the create order request, and then we map the field. So we say the ID is coming from the request dot ID. Actually, we don't do that because this is already applied from the stream. So in this case, we're going to say product name equals request dot product name and then delivery address equals request dot delivery address. Simple as that. Now, you will have to do this for every single event, and I will do that for you so you don't have to watch me type. So here's all the events. You just get that event, and then you apply with using this apply method. You can also, by the way, return order here if you want to have an immutability sort of approach with it. Uh, even if you use sort of records and you say with, and you just return a new object, and then in the end you say, return or return a, a brand new object that you just create in this method. However, there is overhead in C sharp with creating this object over and over again. So I'd say just use this if you actually care about performance. So with that, simple as that, if I go ahead now and I say run my API and 
I do nothing else, don't have to create any database, Martin will do it for me. So if I go on Insomnia and I say create an order for Dome Train Pro for my home in London as the delivery address, then we go ahead and we create it. It's going to take some time to create those uh, fields in the database, but after that, as you can see, you get that order. Now, if I go over here and I say get the order by copying that ID and I say give me this order, then as you'll see, I'm getting the entire order object. So we have this, we have the name, we have the home, and then the rest is null because we haven't really set it. So it goes through that flow and with aggregate stream async on the fly, it builds that order. And if we take a look at the database just to see how this looks, the sequences, routines, as well as a few tables created for us. So we have these events over here, which is ultimately where the events are stored. And you can see here the, the raw JSON object. And then we have the stream. So the stream is a collection of events ultimately. So this is all very simple to implement. However, this one especially we're going to improve because now every time when I read an order or many orders, you're going to have to get a big collection of events to just return back and aggregate on the fly. We don't really want to do that. Instead, what we want to do is we want to build projections, which you can think of as materialized views that represent a projection, a collection of aggregated events that we pre-store. And the great thing about Martin is it does this as a transaction for us, which is one of the big pain points sometimes when you want to try to keep up projections in sync with the stream. So the way you do that is you'd go and create a new class called order projection. And I'll just go ahead and stop this. And you would say that this is a single stream projection for the object of order. And what you do is you again have apply methods. In this case, however, you have the event that you're applying as well as the order you're maintaining the state for. So what this will do is as you set these values, not only will you save that event in the stream, but you will also update the projection that you can then just load by point reading that materialized pre-computed view for your system. If I implement all the methods, this would look something like this. So I will go ahead and delete the duplicate. And then every event I have is using this projection and then it's applying it, building that view for us. However, I have to register that projection. So I'm going to say option dot projections dot add the order projection. And in here I have to specify the projection lifecycle. This is very important. Projection life cycles are allows you to configure how the projection is sort of treated. So if you do in line, which is ultimately the default in a way and what you should do in most cases, uh, but there's some new ones there. Um, inline will actually update the projection on the same transaction as you save a new event. So every time you append a new event, the state will be synchronously and atomically be updated for that projection. So if inserting an event fails, the projection won't be updated. If the update projection fails, the event won't be added. So this is great. There's a few other ways to do this. You can have um, a live projection, which is executed on demand only, and you can have an async projection, which is only executed using the async daemon. This is a bit of a more advanced thing that if this video does well, I will make a video on. So let's just leave this like this and run this API now. And actually, no, not run it yet. We want to go here and change this aggregate stream async to instead use a load async. So again, order ID for the stream ID, but now we're loading because we're loading it from the projection. Now, if I run again and I go on Insomnia and I say create a new order, and I'm doing this because the order hasn't been created using the projection before, then as you're going to see, I have a new thing over here and I can go to get order, put that ID down, and then I'm reading this point from the projection. If you take a look at the table, you can see that I'm reading from empty doc order and I can actually show you the table created now for us here, which is storing that materialized view. It's storing that projection in here. And that is the pre-computed state, which is amazing for performance and for doing queries for big data sets. So ultimately adding the rest is very simple. For example, if I want to update the address, all I'd have to say is I'm going to need an I document store again. So document store and then I'm just appending an event now and then I'm saving. So I don't need to say start new event anymore. I don't need to specify the type. I just say this is the stream ID, take this object, append it. And there's overloads as well that don't need the order ID. They can get it from the object you're saving. So this is lovely. I'm just going to implement the rest of the features. There we go. So now we have all our methods implemented. And the last thing I want to do 
is I want to get all the orders. The way we do this is we get the query session again as the point read for that order, but then we say query that specific type, and then I say to list async, or you can use any of the other methods over here to modify what you're getting back. But fundamentally, on a basic level, this is more than enough. And now, if I go and run this API, I'm going to go back and I'm going to copy that ID. And I'm going to say, OK, now the order needs to be dispatched. So let's go ahead and put that ID down and say, dispatch this order. And as you're going to see after the cold run, the order has been dispatched. I know this because if I say get the order, I now have a dispatch ID. If I copy that and I say now that the order is out for delivery, then I can go ahead and send this event. And then if I get the order, this is set. And likewise, if I do this for the order delivered, then same thing if I go here, I have the state. And this is now stored both as a stream of events that represent the state. And I can say, OK, what was the order like at that moment in time? Or how did the order progress? Or calculate how long does it take for, I don't know, dispatch and delivery? Or how long it took to deliver after it was out for delivery? So many things you can do with something like this, and you can see all the streams here individually as well. And on top of that, you can also get all the events out using this very efficient query method. Martin is an incredible library for things like this. The stuff you can do, this just scraping the surface of what you can possibly do with Martin. And ultimately, if this video does well and you want to see more, leave a comment down below and I will do more because there's so much on this topic. And it is still, after so many years in my career, my favorite way of dealing and storing data. And even though I've never used Martin, I kind of regret it. If we knew about this at the time, there's a very good chance we would have used it because it is excellent. Now I wonder from you, what do you think about Martin and actually event sourcing in general? Are you using it? Leave a comment down below, let me know. Well, that's all I had for you for this video. Thank you very much for watching. And as always, keep coding.